We have a fantastic group of speakers today and uh, I just wanted to say that uh, we are very happy to have you here and uh, I will introduce you now to Jose Ponsu who can uh, then introduce the day of uh, today's sessions and uh, our speakers. Jose. Hello, hello everyone. Thank you for a second day of uh, African Art in Venice Forum. We're really excited to introduce another kind of topical day of interesting talks and um, insights. So we'll be starting with Biennale Ecologies in Contemporary African Art. Biennale, Biennales have become among the most well-established systems to internationally present curatorial projects. Presenters will inspire, will inspire a discussion about the relevance of such a format within the artistic context of African countries, addressing both its possibilities, constraints, and local specificities. Uh, Sandrine Collard de Boc is a curator of the Libombeshi Biennale for 2019. Uh, currently an assistant professor of, at Rutgers University, uh, Collard is a specialist of modern and contemporary African art history, a writer and an independent curator. Holding a PhD from Columbia University in New York, Collard is an international lect lecturer and author of multiple publications. Her recent writings include Sammy Bello G's Hunting and Collecting, um, a, a research project with the the Musée Ostend in 2016, and the expanded subject New Perspectives in African um, in Photographic Portraiture from Africa. Uh, Collard is currently preparing The Way She Looks, A History of Female Gazes in African Photography, in collaboration with the Arthur Walter Collection, um, and published by uh, Rayerson Image Center, Toronto in 2019. Then we have Elvira Diangani Ose. Uh, director of the showroom. Uh, Elvira is uh, obviously director of the showroom. Uh, she's she's re recently been affiliated with, or she's been affiliated with the um, Department of Visual Arts at Goldsmiths and the Thought Council at the Fondazione Prada here in Italy. Um, until November 2018, she served as Creative Times senior curator. Uh, recently, she has been the curator of the eighth edition of the Gothenburg Biennale uh, Gibka in 2015. Previously, Diangani Ose served as curator of international art at Tate Modern um, until 2014. Uh, she's published and lectured on modern art and contributes to journals such as Atlantic, Atlantica and Inca Journal. Christine Ayene. Christine Ayene is a curator of the Casablanca Biennale for 2020. She's an art historian, critic, and curator of Cameroonian origins and a research fellow in the Department of Contemporary Art at the University of Lancashire, where she collaborates on interdisciplinary projects uh, based, based around uh, making, histories, uh, making histories visible, led by the artist Labena Himid. She's a doctoral student at Birkbeck University, where she is writing a thesis on the South African photographer George Heller. Um, INA is artistic director of the fifth Biennale of, C of Casablanca 2020. Uh, her current and upcoming projects include the uh, Sounds Like Her 2017 to 2020, which will uh, take place at the New Art Exchange and tour throughout the UK. Finally, last but not least. Uh, we have uh, Skinder Hundel, a CEO and director of the New Art Exchange. Um, he's been in the post and established the organization um, since September 2008. He has led the organization through a significant period of growth and development, bringing international artists to Nottingham in the UK. Recently, his large-scale projects have included EM15 Midlands Pavilion at the Venice Biennale in 2015, and Doug Fishbone's Leisure Land Golf, A Culture Cloud, and the British Arts Show 7. Uh, Skinder has commissioned significant artists, including Ekrem Zatari, Zarina Bimji, and Sonia Boyce. Uh, Skinder is executive producer of the New Art Exchange's international program titled Here, There, and Everywhere, which spans South Africa, Korea, Africa, the Caribbean, um, and the Middle East. He is executive producer and artistic director of the UK's original Mella Festival in Nottingham. Um, and this panel was produced in collaboration with New Art Exchange. So I wish you all a fruitful dialogue. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for the introduction and uh, what an illustrious panel we do have. Um, so, and also thank you to Neri and Ilaria um, and the um, African Art in Venice team for um, putting such an energy together. It's such a great program. 
and it's great for us from New York Exchange to be participating as a program partner and, and of course to moderate this esteemed panel. Um, so I'm from New Art Exchange, just to give you a bit of background and concept behind why this panel is important to me um, and our organization. So we're one of the UK's national and international spaces based in an inner city neighborhood. And our motto is to think and deliver the new, to create alternative narratives, build systems from within and from outside the center and bring with that experimentation. So to create third spaces of invention um, or new spaces and moments of unforgettable awe um, or creative awe. And in order to boost the presence of new aesthetics um, and new voices, paradigms and opportunities um, for those people that are unseen and unheard in the business of the arts. And here we are. Uh, one-fifth of our way into the 21st century. Um, in 2019, 2019, where many countries in Africa will be marking their 60th year of anniversaries as independent nations, in a world still negotiating layers of time, trauma, memory, and an unaccounted distorted history, and there is a hope and energy in the global south. Yet in the northern hemisphere, where we're based, um, in the UK, New York Exchange it is, um, there's a kind of growing reactionary politics, unsettled perhaps by the displacement of power dynamics and the emergence of uh, global south nations and politics. And, you know, in the art world itself, there's an interesting um, question, um, dilemma perhaps, which talks about the kind of saturation of biennials, art events, and museums having to reinvent themselves, being at risk of burning out, uh, struggling to sustain themselves. And yet across the African subcontinent here, or the continent, um, there feels like a, a new surge of hope and activism of uh, resources that are gathering and instigated by a new breed of cultural and independent thinkers um, and doers, fighting the odds and developing new systems and approaches to art ecological experimentation, such as the work we heard about yesterday from Ibrahim Mahama and Osaid Mansou, um, when we heard about the art and agency discussion, very inspiring. And of course, we pay homage to great leaders and pioneers, Bissi Silva, Opri Anyazar, uh, who have inspired a new generation, uh, created a very strong foundation um, for us to enter into. And this new emergence is now uh, battling against the sort of patterns and systems and values that, um, uh, you know, that reinforce us all becoming subservient, perhaps, to the algorithms of the oppressor, um, quoting Larry Achipong and David Bloom even yesterday. So here we are. Today, we are exploring the biennial, uh, biennials in Africa, key histories, how they have evolved and are evolving. And no doubt the biennial, uh, when delivered well, can be a major force in the representation of internationally curated shows, creating hype and energy and much profile, uh, regenerating cities and places um, and launching um, uh, careers um, for, for many people. So today we will share anecdotal and subjective truths and experiences uh, from our panel, our specialist curators and thinkers, uh, reflecting from their personal experiences about delivering um, and experiencing biennials in Africa, determining their relevance, the context, uh, the challenges and opportunities. So without further ado, let me start by opening uh, with, a, uh, with a, an open question. Um, I'd like to uh, ask the panel members and maybe start with um, whoever wants to ask the, uh, answer and respond um, about the art biennial itself. What, what, what does it mean to you? What does it bring? Um, what's its purpose? Who wants to start with this? Hello? Hello? Hi. Yes. 
So first and foremost, thank you so much for having me here for um, the, um, the panelists, of course, uh, Jose and the rest of the people of the African uh, Forum in Venice. And I have to thank P uh, Picha, Sami, and Gabriele Salmi, who made possible my uh, presence here. But just point, going back to your question, I think um, I always have think that that an exhibition project or any project that intervenes a public sphere has to respond to a matter of urgency, right? So I see the biennial model as an open-ended uh, platform that will allow for such questions to be uh, taken in. Um, and I think in a space in which we have many artists uh, working in the absence of institutions, the biennial, in, and I say a, a very particular take of the biennial, uh, presents us with a possibility of engaging. Uh, it's, it's weird, I see my test. <laughs> Sorry. So I, I think that the biennials present us with the possibility of, of reflecting on the context, um, on the urgency of the matters of that immediate environment, but also to open up a reflection that is international, that is both relevant to the local, but also keep. Uh, a fundamental, let's say, for the local, but relevant to an international audience and expertise. No? Uh, so to me, I, I will say the biennial present that model. That is a very particular take on the biennial, and, and is one that is rooted in the, um, the, the organic, uh, uh, let's say, the organic, the, organ the organicity, let's say, of the, of the context in which the biennial takes place. Thank you, Christine and Sandrine. Can you hear? Oh, okay, sorry. Um, I think, I mean, if we come back, for instance, to the Dakar Biennial, um, I mean, it, it, coming back to what Elvira was saying about the Biennial being organic, it, it's very much, um, it was very much inspired by the artists in the Dakar Biennial because the, they wanted to have, I mean, there was an event in 1990 on literature, and the artists in it said that, you know, we need to have a, the same thing for visual art. And then in 92, they had the first Dakar Biennial. And if, like, if, also if I take the example of the Casablanca Biennial in French America, it actually started from a, a residency in uh, Ottawa, and then that was created in 2010, and then the Biennial came after the residency. So it, it's, it was initiated by Mostafa Mahmoud, who's a, a Moroccan photographer, and it came, it wasn't like a project, he didn't say, oh, I'm going to create a Biennial just for the sake of it, but it was the result of artists studying in France and they over a long period of time they had residencies and then sh it was showcased in, in, in Casablanca and then over the two years that, that's why it became a biennial because it was um, essentially a, a sort of calendar of like big, big exhibitions being every two years. Yeah, so what does the biennial um, mean to you personally? I mean, first of all, what does it bring to you? So, yeah. Uh, well, I would say there's what you want. I mean, like I, I can't specify in terms of the, the context within which you want. Um, ideally, for me, it's like it's a kind of like a biennial is like a, a place where you can make a curatorial statement. So, in theory, the, the, the projects that you want to develop, the conversations you want to, to have with the artists, and also how you want to engage with the audience. But in reality, if I take the example of the Dakar Biennial, for instance, that I co-curated in 2012, it was very challenging to have um, to be able to sort of translate what you, what I wanted to do as a curator. Um, I mean, we had two exhibitions. One it was a uh, international exhibition that we were working on the three of us, and we had like uh, another exhibition. I think it was three like solo presentations, and it was very challenging because the between what we wanted to do. And the structure of the biennial, it, you know, it's, it's Dakar is a very difficult place to do that. So I'd say, yeah, it's supposed to be, um, you know, a way for a curator to put forth their curatorial statement, but it's not always possible. We're going to come on to that in the next room as well, because I think that's a very interesting area too, and we, and we love it. Yeah. And Sandrine, your experience of uh, the art biennial, what does it mean to you? And how does it translate into action? Yeah. 
Can you switch the buttons? Oops, is it working now? Yeah, it's working. Um, and it's Start interesting again. that you bring the, um, the the historical perspective because if we even go further back in time, you know, before the Dakar Biennale, I think the main point was that the Festival des Armes was really the ancestor of the Dakar Biennale. And what I think is interesting is that this festival or the Johannesburg Biennale or Documenta or all events that you know um, were born as a sort of re-entry into the world. You know, the Johannesburg after um, the end of apartheid. Festival des Arts Negres after uh, the end of colonialism. So there's really a sense for me of, of how from our own local perspective um, do we live together and how does it translate politically and artistically. So it's really a way of taking that temperature, I would say, um, every two years, a sort of you know, global diary. And, and ideally, when you when we'll, we'll look back at all these Biennales and this proliferation of Biennales that are happening now, you know, it will be a sort of global diary of, of the 21st century. Uh, if I if I can just go back to both your points, I think there is something very important that at least operates for me, um, because I I think in the context and in, in, in the context in which I operate or artists work or, or develop their practice is fundamental to the way I think as a curator, no? and and in a way I want to even go further in time uh, historically because of course to me the the public space and actually how artists developing their projects with communities or in general linking or trying to engage with this context is very important. No? And you put, for example, like the example of Casablanca in the 1970s, no? the presenting work in the street is, is also part of that tradition. No? But also I'm thinking in 1940s and 50s, um, uh, street uh, theater, right? Like that helped to um, make visible uh, claims for independence, right? Or even previous, if, you, if we want to go historically, Way way back is the is the performance of tradition, right? And how such an, an understanding of the communal claim or the communal engagement or the, the communal production is part also of what one can bring together in a dialogue. No? And and I just wanted to put the example of Lubumbashi Biennial, which is the only biennial that I had curated in the continent, because that is where the clash between what you want to produce, as you were saying, as a curator, and what um, the space can offer, both in terms of the infrastructure, but also the possibilities of the social engagement, or the possibility of the political setting. No? I, I um, refer to some of the, in, in a way, in a very positive and very, um, an empowering way, when I speak with, about the uh, Lubumbashi Biennial, I always refer to precarity you know, as an organizing principle. But not because um, it, was a lim it was limited, and I don't know if you know the story, but just to give you a little bit of background, I was invited to, um, to produce the 2012 uh, Lubumbashi Biennial, but we didn't reach the money that we needed, so we had to postpone it. And when the 2013 was arriving and, and we had to decide what to do, we had even less money than the year before, but I said, we had to do it. We had to do it because this belongs to the people as much as belong to us. And I had to decide that it wasn't about having the perfect setting, it was about to work with what we had and transfer the place to present this communal practice, this communal production. And we did a biennial that was basically the claim of people to be there. We did a biennial that didn't have any frame, uh, but we uh, still remain with the standard of display, so the perception of the world will have been the same that if you go to, a, let's say, a formal museum. We did a biennial that was a lot based on experience, um, and a lot based on what we could share together, what we could think together, how can we also claim ownership of that event, no matter in which conditions, um, every you know the, for the next following two years, and you see you have now <laughs> the next edition. Talking of, talking of ownership, curatorial control. Um, one one thing that's really important to note as a fellow leadership figure, um, that you as uh, you know African women um, are playing an active role in determining curatorial statement, the kind of subjective prism of uh, of your truth and observation how it then informs I mean, the art ecology. So I guess a, a question might be around that, like what keeps you awake? What creates the urgency um, in this kind of collaborative ownership that you've talked about in your maybe you've seen dreams. Yeah, I just wanted to talk, talk specifically about um, the 
and Dash, you know, um, what for me was really important was to sort of um, in the fight against this excess of representation that the Congo has here. This is something that's true for the whole continent, but I think that when we utter the word Congo, it really comes even more with the sort of baggage, uh, you know, representation baggage, something that has not been determined by uh, local people. So for me, it was really important to sort of, um, you know, bring forward a new poetics of the place, a way to think locally, to think about the local in a very different way. And when it comes to Lubumbashi and the Katanga, Katanga province in particular, you know, the, um, the resources, natural resources of the place have really been fundamental. That's, you know, when you hear about the Congo and when you hear about the Tang Katanga, it's really the geopolitical, you know, importance of the place uh, in terms of its mineral resources. And what I wanted to, to do was really to flip the script, to use these geographical positions, this precise geographical position, but to talk about the place differently. And so um, that's why I came up with this idea of the equator, you know, the conflict in, in, in this line of the equator. And for me, it was, it was really, um, I really liked it immediately because it was bringing a whole new set of uh, envisioning of the place. Uh, you know, it suddenly made it a different type of symbol, you know, the perpetually updated heart of darkness, but suddenly, you know, it was this line that was, di that was actually weaving together northern and southern hemispheres. Um, it was something that also not only spoke about a sort of north-south co connection, but it also spoke about kind of uh, Indonesia, for instance, you know, because we are on the same line. So it also opened up a whole new world of connections uh, when you talk about that place. And, um, you know, all new sorts of, uh, we were talking about uh, this idea of the horizon. Uh, Elvira, you probably remember how night falls very quickly, you know, in the Congo, and it, uh, in it, um, the sun uh, rises up very quickly too. And for me, it was also speaking to this sort of uh, new horizon that comes up every morning so, uh, as, a, as an idea that even from such a place that has been over-determined, you know, uh, by all different kinds of representation, we can envision something new. Um, so that, that was really what was important for me with this with this edition. But I, I use a lot of enthusiasm as well. <laughs> I like this um, idea of metaphor and the sense of the horizon as the new horizon of good and the spirit of the good favor. Mm -hmm. What's interesting is that we have another panelist who's not in the room. <laughs> um, and unfortunately, he is not present, so I will be doing this. However, did send me a written statement. And I think that perspective is interesting because it plays on where we're at in our conversation about the new horizon and the relationship between north south, but south to south. So I'm going to just read this out. Um, apologies if I don't have a Cuban accent. Um, <laughs> um, but this is from uh, Sara Alonso Gomez. So in the last 10 years, I have been trying to develop triangular projects between Latin America, Europe, and more recently, Africa. At the very stage, it seemed to everybody like a real utopia, taking into consideration that what we call today globalization just happens in a very fragmented, in temporal and multi-spatial dimension. I am Cuban and from a southern, southern perspective. We have to take into consideration that most of the time it is easier to establish north to south connections and networks than south to south experiences. Since the very way on in which international cultural cooperation enhances these forms of relations and creates new bases for neo-colonialism, colonization. My background is that of an important mega exhibition founded in the early 1984, and that is the Biennial of Havana, which premises were those of embracing the artistic practice of the then called third world, including artists from Latin America, Africa, but also Middle East and Asia, that's right now. Are we Skyping? I feel like we're Skyping, perhaps. Um, the, <laughs> the bridge between Latin America and Africa seemed to me then possible. These two regions share an enormous amount of features, and the list would be very long to cite here. But as a post-colonial territories, we both face the challenge of representation, how to blow up these traditional ways of representation for these both regions. How would we be possible? to blow up that kind of representation in order to create new ways of seeing, of saying, and relating um, 
Someone seen yesterday, someone said yesterday that Africa was irrep not representable. Um, this seems to me one of the key points to develop through our practices as curators and researchers in the region. I'll stop there because my reading skills are falling apart. On, on that conversation, you were listening, I hope. Um, what, what was your response to this kind of South to South development? Um, I didn't understand that question. Um, I was, I mean, the theme of the Bangui was a very strong object, and I was very much interested in the, the relationship between Morocco. Show us some of your images, just to so if we can switch to the screen, just to those images. Maybe we can go through um, uh, yeah, so the concept yeah, behind so and, and yeah, the next so one. The theme lecture for the phase one water module was very much inspired by the residence of Africa in Morocco, in Africa, um, where um, I mean it's completely connected with the modern world and the Africa that we know from that. So I went there. Inspired me to be in the coast of Morocco because the, the Atlantic Ocean is the one that is deep in the Western Africa and it's very close to the Atlantic Ocean and the Indian Ocean. Um, and so I was very much, and also at the same time, I was very much interested in the relationship between Morocco and the Western world. As you know, you know that the country, contemporary art we don't have none. So I became very much interested in these places where that are not connected to the mainstream, so it's not subterranean or like you know in the Indian Ocean. And and I thought about what kind of dialects we can have in those places that are not you know London or Paris or New York. Um, so that's that's how the theme came. And um, and actually, this, so this is an image of the Red Mountain. It's very beautiful, very peaceful, very inspiring for artists. And we have like fourteen. Um, like accommodations for artists, like little houses for artists to come, and uh, these are some of the workshops that uh, they can be painting, uh, uh, photography, etc. Um, and uh, and so one of the things that I did was uh, invite a curator whose practice I've been following for years. I mean, I have been following for years, Emma Tavola from uh, New Zealand, who's uh, one of the from one of the native uh, native islands, um, and so we worked together to develop a continent of Africa and Africa also in New Zealand. And what really moved me was when we had a, so these are images of the Congo Lake, um, just showing, we, we had a, con a conference at the Institut Francais, French Institute, and I was really moved that she said that I was uh, the first, the first non-white non curator to invite her to, uh, you know, to do a project outside of uh, New Zealand. And, you know, it shows this kind of, uh, Conversation, the the you know the desire from other curators and practitioners from other you know the south to work to create a dialogue from the south to the south. And so that was one of the things that I did. I suppose the um, the issue here is about voice expression um, and what's being defined and who's doing the defining. And you know the term non-white, you know, itself has a contentious you know uh, narrative behind it. Um, you know. You know, you're African, yes, um, you're a curator first, but with that comes a cult cultural prism and expression and ownership, in a sense, of a voice that's missing in the art world. That might, that's missing in the art world. Yeah, I think, I mean, for her, it, you know, it was, I think she was really enthusiastic about the, ca the kind of dialogue that we can have. Uh, I mean, I was, uh, after that, I was invited in Australia for mm -hmm. the Kagoma uh, Triennial. And even there, I attended the conference, and it was really interesting to see the sort of post-colonial conversations that they are, they're having, and they had like no African speakers on the panel, and and so we we do have like conversations that we you know that to just to also uh, somehow support your argument, but going back and and I think this dialogue, of course, south to south, and and the idea of the global south more as a concept than a geographical. Entity, you know, more as a, a paradigm for discourse and exchange than a geographical issue. You know? 
Um, and I want to go back to history again, because of course, uh, since the Bandun conference in 1955, there have been many connections between peoples in those um, different sides of Atlantic and other oceans, right? So, so think about, and I was thinking, uh, what Sarah should know this as Cuban. <laughs> uh, in 1968, the conference in the, the three continental conference uh, in the Havana, no? that, that connected people from Africa, Asia, and, and America. No? And how there was, a, of course, an, an interest to uh, create also um, uh, a cultural environment in which some of the concerns that we are developing now, that these workshops also reveal, were put on the stake. Think about the biennial. Uh, in Dakar, the second edition in 1998, where there was an inter interest in the diaspora, right? But be in between that, there had been many, many um, conversations that had to do with, uh, you know, the, the establishing of the negritude, the ideas around black internationalism, that sometimes happened in literature, sometimes happened in art, in the 50s, 60s, 70s. I mean, what I'm trying to, to, to sort of like make a, a here a claim is that, um, that this is not new, that we might have somehow uh, lost touch on how to do that, and, and that, of course, there is a specific economic uh, paradigm in which this relationship, practically in practical terms, can take place. I mean, now we are in the digital world, and with new media, we can do a lot of things. We don't necessarily need to travel to be together in that state of mind. But also, uh, and I keep thinking of this, like, I think we, we need to, um, to, to, to remind ourselves that, that, it, that, that, that f and, and that's why I bring back to the history, you know, like the, these conversations that are taking place in New Zealand, like the Gabriela Salgado that is now part of, of that, is inviting artists that she had worked with in, uh, in the UK, uh, like um, uh, Faisana Duala, you know, and then all, all of a the sudden there is a different conversation that you can have these uh, in these spaces but but the idea is to really go back and reflect on, on what these connections have been so that we can continue building up and we are not uh, coming from a vacuum right? and I think it's important to remember that this that has been happening in so many stages yes, I, I, I agree I agree with that Vera, and I think that it's probably you know one of your questions was about Eurocentrism and it's probably something that sometimes fell under the radar just because there's a privileging of this sort of European African connection. But of course, you know, all these discussions have happened for a long time. And I think that Elvira is exactly right in trying to remember that long, you know, remind us of that long history. And earlier, Sandra, you were talking about the kind of idea of the biennial and its impact on art ecology and what evolves. And we were observing the kind of modern sort of era of the last decade. You made some interesting points about your observation around the evolving context of um, the uh, African art scene uh, globally, but also uh, diasporically, but also here within Africa. Can you share some of those thoughts with, with the, the panel and audience? Well, yes, one of, one of the question was how, you know, has the um, African art context evolved um, this last year? And one of the most, first of all, one of the most interesting things is the feminization <laughs> of the profession. I think that this panel proves it. And I think it's it's important too because um, I was very touched, I don't know if you've seen that, at the last Charja Biennale, you know, the artist Otobon Kanga got the prize and the, there is a strong connection between herself and Koyokuo. And, you know, they, they, they were telling how they basically built each other up. And I think for me, one important thing also is to, of course, showcase female African artists. So that's definitely something that has changed for me in the last you know, um, 10, 15 years is that you have more and more um, female African artists. But uh, even larger than that, there really has been, uh, in my opinion, a uh, long overdue, but still um, return of the center of gravity on the continent, which is something, you know, uh, which is something that was not necessarily true 15 years back in time. Uh, when you think about, you know, who one of the most authoritative voice, you know, Ashim Bembe is a Cameroonian thinker who lives and works in Johannesburg. Kuyo Kuo, you know, went from Senegal to uh, Johannesburg without going to one of the West Western institutions. The most uh, successful African artist, Ellen Atsui, lives and work on the continent. So for me, it's really interesting to see how um, the continent, and of course, the 
you know, that's only normal, but that it's really becoming the center of its own discourse and that the discourse is also is created from the continent. And to me, that's one of the most, um, you know, exciting development of these last years, definitely. Can I, can I just say, sorry, no, because of course, I mean, I'm a diaspora baby, uh, somebody said to me in, the, in, in Agana, in, in Kumasi. Tell us, tell us more about this. Yes, no, I, I think, yeah. I mean, when I, of course, I agree with you in, in the fact that uh, the art scene locally is becoming more self-sustainable. Mm. There are uh, references to direct, I mean, the, the, so let's say the, the, the ecology mm. of the communities within the nations and also internationally within the continent, but also with the diaspora. I mean, I don't want to have a conversation that pretends, for instance, like, even conceptually speaking, the, the persons that Achil, Koyo, Otobon, we, we are developing our practice in a conversation, even if sometimes when it is to, um, to contest uh, and to unlearn certain ways of doing that we have uh, achieved in the West, but we, we started from that perspective. So I, I think we ha one has to be careful when we talk about how also diaspora contribute to an understanding of what Africanness mean in that respect. No? Because I think, what, and, and this is one thing that is in, extremely important for all of us, no? that, they, that they are, as, you know, for instance, ASICO, uh, we, uh, led by VC Silva, is one of the most extraordinary and, and yet to be challenged um, uh, uh, unconventional, uh, uh, radically experimental ways of working together as artists and curators in worship for a month and a half in different cities in the continent. Because BC understood better than anybody that nurturing the local artist scene and creating people that is not going to become just the curator, but also that could somehow contribute to the scenes in different roles mm -hmm. is fundamental. No? So to me, of course, I am, um, and everything that I have done in my life is to contribute so then um, you know, the local artist scene can develop on its own. But I don't want to start a conversation in which diaspora doesn't take place because even conceptually, diaspora has a place in the in the people that uh, is working and study and forming themselves in the continent. So, Christine, let me. I was just going to ask. I was going to say. Yeah. I think there's, there's, there is there's, um, always like a, a back and forth uh, mm -hmm. conversation between you know uh, us from the diaspora and, and the continent. Um, so yeah, I think uh, I just wanted to add that. Also, around the kind of, and Ovira, you mentioned the kind of non-conventional, unconventional, and the kind of what's been happening the turn of the century, into the 21st century here in Africa, in particular, and with diaspora communities, is this kind of um, bypassing of infrastructures and the creation of one's own systems, like more independent artist groups emerging, um, who are, are creating their own biennials, making, failing, recreating, etc., and reinventing. And we're seeing a lot more of that happening. Um, maybe sort of a comment on that, Christine, about your 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 experience of, of coming through the 80s, 90s, um, and seeing what's happened today. I mean, we had a lovely story that you were sharing about your first biennial. Um, in, I think it was Johannesburg, right? And on where we are today and what sort of systems have, are emerging as a consequence of the 21st century shift and this new kind of drive. In Africa. I mean, so when I was talking about my first experience of visiting a biennial was when I was a student um, in 1997 in Johannesburg, so the second Johannesburg biennial, curated by Ed Gray, who's not here anymore. Um, and yeah, so, so what, was, what was your question? The question was really about what, what your observation from then to now is, yeah. because there's a, there's a long gap. There. There's about 20, 30 years. I think for me, what was okay. So when I was a student, uh, so I studied in Paris, history of art, and my dream was that I, I was sort of uh, following the biennials, and I was like, oh, I'd love to work on the Dakar biennial, uh, like not to curate because the term like it wasn't, you know, it didn't really exist at the time. Uh, that's how old I am now. Um, <laughs> and um, and so my but my the first biennial I visited was uh, uh, Johannesburg and. Uh, and for me, it was really interesting because I saw, I mean, it was an international exhibition. So it was also the idea of coming out of this, um, you know, African, like Pan-African biennial and having a, you know, African artists in conversation with 
at the end of my high school year. Um, yeah, it was a, a great experience. Um, you know, seeing the, the, the type of works, but also the, um, I mean, the issue, when I went to, uh, I couldn't go to the opening, but I went, I think, in December, and the Biennale was supposed to close in January, I think, and they they actually wanted, the uh, Johannes uh, like City Council wanted to uh, shut down the Biennial before, before the end, because, um, this, you know, there was this controversy about all this money going to art, uh, when the money could have gone to like more, you know, uh, essential needs. Um, so yesterday we heard from Ibrahim talking about how he's transforming, in a way, in his five-year experiment, um, a place by reinvesting in yeah. and creating an economy. So we were talking about this yeah, earlier. Yeah, of course. For us, we know. I mean, as people who work in the arts, we know that artists. I mean, I was talking the example of Ella Matsui. You know, when he's creating a massive piece, he's also employing people. I mean, there is an economy behind art, and I think. Uh, I mean, the fact that. Uh, we have art fairs. I mean, there's 154 mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. You know, that's showing in uh, in Marrakesh. Uh, it was the second edition mm -hmm. this year. Uh, in Douala, we have a new art fair. It's going to be the second edition, I think, in Cameroon, in Douala. So I think there is a um, yeah. There's been a change in in that. Also, I, I think maybe the younger generation, mm -hmm. you know, people who have money and who are consumer of art, you know, in Africa, can also you know, make a statement and make a difference in as to how art, you know, art is perceived on the continent. So this, there's this element of that, you know, the, the sort of a understanding or the the, you okay. know, the broadening of this idea that art is more than you know is is more like than something uh, that's trivial. It's you know it's it has value. It has financial value, and it has a social value as well. I mean, one one of one of our kind of dialogues earlier on, Sandri and we were talking about, um, and, and chip in everyone on this, um, about the biennial coming and going, and is it kind of the spectacle and all at that moment? Um, and yes, it's great for the echo chamber of the art world, right? the artists, the curators that benefit. How does it really impact and engage local communities? Communities that are often distracted by survival, or actually not distracted by, um, absolutely involved in sustaining their own lives and not having the opportunity to engage with the, the privileges that we see, we have, I, we're traveling internationally. How does the biennial impact on a day-to-day -day within the arts in Sandrine? Well, you know, when we were talking about the, the constraints of it working? Yes, of, um, of the Lubumbashi Biennale, one of them being that you don't have a lot of exhibition spaces, so that you have no choice, what I've, what I've called guerrilla curating, <laughs> you have no choice but to use the outdoor spaces, you know, so that people are in touch with the artwork when they, um, you know, just walk around the city, because it happens a lot, a lot um, out, you know, outside. Um, what was the second part of your question? <laughs> oh yes, the BNL as a moment. Yeah. Well, what is interesting also with uh, Lubumbashi is that it's powered by this local organization called Picha, so that the BNL is really a high point, you know, um, in the life of this organization. But it's definitely not the only thing, um, you know. Between the Biennales, you have workshops, you have, you have residencies by artists, and even at the time of the Biennale, um, and this is something that started during the last edition, I believe, um, you have workshops organized for um, you know local artists, so that you know they can really be in touch right. with the artists. You really have this sort of um, organicity, as you were saying, between uh, between artists, uh, something that help really help to the artistic practices locally, but also discourses. Right. Uh, we will have you know, a series of conferences, and that was really something that was dear to my heart because I wanted you know, especially uh, local students to be able to be part of this forum, really an opening up mm -hmm. of discussion, not just you know, um, have this exhibition, this is what we give to you, and then <laughs> we take it away. So I think all these um, different dimensions is really something that helps mm -hmm. Um, you know, really create a, a sort of symbiosis. And then one thing that was, that was also important for me is that you really have a thriving artistic scene in the Congo, but you don't yet have, you know, enough local art critics mm -hmm. or local art curators. So um, 
one thing that I'm doing with this uh, edition, and it's, you know, there's no art historical program in Lubumbashi, so this is not something that's uh, easy to find, but I'm working with a, you know, a local person who I, you know, train as we, as we prepare to be now, because for me it's really important that mm -hmm. local artists are being, yes. you know, uh, criticized and apprehended by local people. And, and so I, I also want to, I mean, following up what you were saying in terms of the Lumumbashi Biennial, which is an extraordinary model in that way, you know, uh, not only because um, uh, they, have, they started as they started as worship. The first, very first edition was international worships. And then they started using the public space. And in, the, in our case, because of course it's a, a biennial initially based on photography, right? And, and Simon and Jamie, Simon Jamie, uh, what he managed to produce was to this display in the public space. But when I was there, not even the structures to hand the photographies were in place. So we actually had to occupy spaces uh, in order to produce this, uh, this project, the spaces that were incredible, that belongs to, let's say, the memory of, of uh, the, um, the, uh, the, the historical, uh, the colonial uh, experience. And I want you to talk a little bit about Kinshasa, because I, I think it will be important to see how that reflects in relation to, uh, to Lubumbashi. But I want to also to bring a different, and that you made me think of, uh, which is dual art, right? Mm -hmm. Dual art as a model in the suit, the Salon Van de Dual Art, uh, is an incredible uh, proposition of how one can engage in um, community-based project that at the same time are presenting uh, absolutely and critically recognized uh, uh, relevant artistic work. Right. And that is done with the community, and it happened during uh, the, the time previous to the presentation, let's say, to the public. But also, of course, it continues because it is rooted in the day-to-day -day experience of the community. So one of the things that I, I think is important, not only for biennials in the continent, but also biennials elsewhere, and that was my, for instance, my take when I did the Gothenburg Biennial, was that you, during the time of the biennial, there is a spot light to specific issues that affect that context, mm. that are in dialogue with people internationally, but the rest of the, the, those issues exist before and after the biennial. The biennial has to be the time where you, it's like almost like you open your house mm. to okay. guests which are local, because of course thinking in the local audience during the biennial is also fundamental, but also international. But it's something that is already happening and it's something that will continue to happen when you go. I mean, what was interesting, Christine? I'm sorry, is it working? Yes. Um, about that, I mean, and also, yeah, what you're saying about the, you know, an issue that exists before, and I mean, the theme of the biennial next year is on, I'm, I'm interested in language, and um, when we uh, did the biennial last time, the, we had a, a few proposals that we, we couldn't take on board because of the finance, financial constraints of um, artists exploring um, Amazir, uh, Berber culture, so sort of, you know, some of the marginalized languages in Morocco. So, I mean, that's going to be the theme. You know, it's sort of been announced because we had a, a call for artists. But I also want to answer to your first question about how um, we're talking about, you know, between the biennials and how, you know, how do you, how do you continue engaging with the, the audience? For Casablanca, we did a, I mean, I'm very keen to work with the students from uh, the School of Fine Arts. So we had two artists working with the, the students so that, the, the picture yeah. in the, at the bottom. Thierry Geoffroy, Geoffroy right? who's uh, probably here in Venice. Professional well. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, and also uh, what I what I did as well. We have um, we had like vacant spaces behind the offices, and I decided to use those spaces as a project space. Um, I call it project space because it's not a gallery. It's not going to be open every time, but it's for artists to come and be in residency and sh showcase work in progress from time to time. But um, our offices are located in like a, a popular area, and I'm very keen to engage with the, uh, with you know, local like non-art dedicated audiences. Uh, but also to be present during, uh, I think, yeah, it's, it's important to be present throughout the year. And one of the difficulties for Dakar, for instance, was that, you know, they, they, they don't provide you with the budget to come and do projects. Okay. I mean, when I did in 2012, actually, I, I gave you a name because I accepted to do it. I said that I will do it if, uh, if I can select some of the co-curators, you know, who are professional curators, and you were doing Lumumbashi and the Tate. Yeah. So it was a great... My experience at Dakar um, Biennial, Dakar, was incredible. The energy they create, 
um, the kind of um, the president arrives, so they take it very seriously at a political level. Um, they engage a lot of collateral events. There's about yeah. 90 venues yeah. around the core program. They had, that's one of the things that is mm. more crucial no? in, the, uh, in all these projects. One of the things that I think it is a matter of ownership, you were saying at the beginning, is that this is a communal ownership. Mm. Biennials in Africa, more than in any other place, probably right. Latin America and Asia the same, no? are things that people claim the audience claims, they want the biennial to happen again. And that's why, no matter what you want to do, I think I wanted to go back to what you were saying in terms of curatorial control, which I found terrible. I'm sorry to say. I feel like I don't want to have it. Have what, sorry? Curatorial control. I don't want to have it. I think biennials is a model to, um, to right. relinquish control. Right. Yes. Okay. I think you need to let go and you need to, I'm with to, to, to have this communal engagement. And I think there is something about, like um, about being, a, being a possibility for hmm. uncertainty and in a hmm. way that you know, working in a museum will never be or working in a certain way you had to deliver a program will hmm. never allow you or know as much. It's, it's always dangerous for, to, to generalize, but I think there is a you know, this kind of communal um, sort of global South culture that is quite collaborative. And it's interesting, um, one of Sara Alonso Gomez's projects at the moment is the Yango uh, Biennial in, uh, in Kinshasa. It's a new biennial. And they're investing in new spaces with communities. And it's actually the second one. Oh, it's the second it's one? It was the Biennial okay. founded by Kiri P, the very much regretted Kiri P. Katembo. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And what they're doing is investing in community infrastructures, new spaces, alternative mm. spaces beyond the YQ, beyond the kind of, you know, curated expertise um, that we um, sort of presume. But, but the thing is that, as, as we were saying, I mean, in my case, I use some spaces in Lubumbashi to develop projects, but this is the way that also Lubumbashi, like uh, Picha started. When they didn't have a venue, they used to meet in uh, Katambay's house or they used to go to somebody else's house okay. or use an international cultural center that didn't have the venues. But I think one of the issues that is important in all this uh, environment is, is precisely because of the absence of this institution that something else emerged. And that is what I think sort of like hookahs <laughs> to well, work there. <laughs> you just entered into the territory of uh, futurisms. Um, so I was going to ask the question around the kind of futurology of the ecology, um, a lot of ologies. Um, but this futurology of the ecology is um, something that we bring to the fore, in usually, um, um, at the moment we're in, because it's kind of contemporary, um, sort of design um, that um, brings an alternative perspective that no one is seeing. However, if you were to predict uh, the kind of futurism of the uh, biennial in Africa or the art ecology within Africa that sits around the kind of heightened spectacle, what, what would you dream to, to see as the utopia? Because there are a lot of challenges. There are a lot of distinct signatures that define the moment and site within the spaces of Africa. To me, it's, it's interesting how, um, you know, right now we have all the, this raging debate about restitution, uh, you know, when it comes to classical African art. And to me, it has, it, it's interesting how it has left completely untouched the question that Contemporary African art is, you know, still uh, for its vast majority exhibited, not on the continent, owned, not on the continent. And so ideally what I, what I hope for the future is really to have, you know, more exhibition space, more collectors, more people buying the work, you know, on the continent for it to be able to be shown on a more regular basis, you know, locally. Um, that's my hope <laughs> and that's how I envision the future. Uh, yes, that, that, that's, that, I would say that's the main thing for me. Really something that, you know, artists responding to their own local audience would be, would be great. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, I'd say for me, um, for Casablanca, the way I see Casablanca, I see it as a um, template. I don't know if I can say that. Yes. But, I, but I sort of want to, I mean, last time was a 2018 edition was quite challenging because I tried to implement some things that 
I thought would make the Dainul better, and I think it, it will in, in the long run. But I'm, I'm very much, uh, I think of it as a, as a platform also for training, and I'm thinking, I mean, that's why I, I'm so uh, uh, passionate about uh, engaging um, the students, because, you know, they're, they're young, but they're also bringing other, you know, some of their friends who are not uh, particularly interested in arts, but, you know, they can sort of widen, uh, um, you know, the, the, not the audience in, term, in terms of oh, having numbers of people who visit, but like this, I'm interested in the experience of art and what it, I mean, if I think of myself when I was younger and what art brought me, that, you know, I, I couldn't imagine that, you know, and um, so yeah, I see it as a as a, as a as a place or space of inspiration for the younger generation. Maybe because I'm a mom, I don't know. <laughs> uh, but also, yeah, very much in terms of training and what do you leave. And particularly since BC passed away, I've, I've been thinking a lot of. of uh, I don't have fun. Let's not get yeah. emotional. <laughs> but I've been thinking a lot about uh, you know wh why we do that as curators. I mean. For many years we've been doing that because, um, and even like the generation before, Okwe, uh, Simon, we've been doing that to sort of reclaim the discourse around our art. Yes. So it's been very much that, and now I'm thinking, okay, but you know, obviously no one is eternal, then what do you leave to the younger generation? You know, what tools do you leave them? So that's, I, I see Casablanca Blanca as that, you know, as a, as a platform for training. I also want to train someone, you know, to, to I, I mean, New Art Exchange is going to, to partner with me in terms of tra <laughs> training, uh, training two, yes, two people, yeah. <laughs> uh, but also, yeah, I'm, I'm keen to sort Maybe of work. More. Sorry. Maybe more. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm very keen to train uh, like young Moroccan. And, and I must say, I lived in Morocco before living in England. Right. So when I, I I'm, you know, I'm from Paris, and when I decided to leave France, I lived in Morocco. So that's somehow 18 years ago. I right. chose to live in this country. Um, and now I'm, so I'm your your futurism is really about sort of guarding the future through the uh, emergence of trained, skilled, yeah. excited, passionate yeah. uh, generation. Elvira. Um, I just want to say that, that I, of course, I agree with you both. I think it's important to, and I was thinking when you were talking, Sandrine, I was thinking on the, the history of exhibition, not like the history of the presentation of African art elsewhere has also been the history of the claim of ownership of that art, of uh, the time that you can follow exhibition making, um, and uh, history tells you about how artists, curators, and thinkers have been claiming ownership and have been transformed into agents and narrators of their own story, of our own story. No, I feel this is the, the, where I'm coming from. And I see that, as you said, no, there has to be more ownership in terms of people that own and produce collections that are public and can be seen by people locally. Um, also, uh, as you were saying, no, training is fundamental. BC's work is incredible in that respect. No, to continue to nurture young minds into what it means to have a self-sustainable um, uh, 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 ecosystem, right? But I will say my also my wish <laughs> is that in doing all of that, we won't transform into the sort of a more, let's say, westernized structure in that space. What I hope is that because the challenge still will persist, we will have the capacity to uh, create tools that will allow us to live in any kind of temporality and conditions, right? So I hope that there is the sense of experimentation, the acceptance of failure as part of processes will continue to be there. So really my hope is that there is something still uncertain and that we can claim, something is still undescribable that will hook you, you, me, and the audience into coming and going to, um, to visit these uh, extraordinary events. Um, yeah. Thank you. It's a great manifesto. So uh, we're at the stage where we're coming to the end of our panel discussion. Um, I know there's some enthusiastic people out there. Is there a roaming mic, Alexandria? We have one here, then we can share this. Um, and then we can take some questions. Think about your questions, do not be shy. This is the moment to ask, or you can ask in the foyer, of course. But it's always good to share the moment on stage because it's recorded and that way it doc gets documented.
Okay, so we have a question here, and then a question there as well afterwards. Hi. Um, um, I, well, I am an old hag, <laughs> so I kind of feel like a, a, a intergenerational returning to something, but with uh, another keyword. What is it that is generative that keeps drawing me back? And it just seemed to me that it, I, I, for me, it's to do with the, put the question a different way. Does the format perform? Yeah? What does the per format perform mm -hmm. in the light of the moment we are now in? Okay. And the moment we are now <laughs> in enables us to get to, I suppose, the invitation to a jazz dance. Okay? Well, okay. well put it another way again. <clears throat> okay. Let's for a moment say, well, if you taking cue from Ashim Bembe, the who argues that the, the the precariety of the African condition will become the major event of the 21st century. Okay? <clears throat> and if you put it like that, then you then ask the question. What does the Biennale as a format perform? Mm -hmm. So it's in that sense that the historical matters a great deal. Okay. Okay. The, 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 the second point I make is to do with, the, again, Africa being the front, the, the last frontier of capitalism. Mm -hmm. And immediately you ask the question, well, what does it say to, to the visual, visual arts and the kind of fields most of you work in, given it's proximity to the neoliberal story. Okay, so we've got two... And, and, and perhaps... Okay. An, 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 an no. <laughs> These are great questions. Um, yes, they're, I mean, they're, the, connected. they're connected. I mean, yeah. No? Oh, hang on a minute, hang on a minute. Oh, you've got more. Oh. Hang on a minute, I just want to pull them together so you can respond to them okay. better, okay? And, 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 and the other one, the other two, yeah. is in part in, as a sort of gesture to, mm. to Alana Lockwood, to BC, to Okwe. Mm. Mm who is very difficult right now to think with them mm -hmm. in the moment of memory remembering. Yeah? What, 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 how, do, how do we get to those affordances of power, homosexuality and post calling for example, questions of the party. On another, how to think in and through Mbiti's observation that what he calls the money time, that in the Af Af futurism on the continent mm -hmm. is in relation to the past, not mm -hmm. to what is to come, right? That's so, so. But, uh, but the jurist, that's what I, <laughs> I've been talking about. No, I, I, Did, no, I hear no. that. I hear let that. Me, let me so the, in. So the <laughs> I mean, the thing is, the thing is, I mean, of course, you, you had raised so many points, but some of them were already, I think at least I, I had the impression that I had respond to those pledge, no? in the sense that the, the going back to some historical moments in which certain connections have been made, but also how the performance of, of any event, really. Uh, this happened, that's why I, I was saying at the beginning, this is an open-ended model that we can do whatever we want, in a, and we have a license that perhaps some other biennials in the, in, in the Western world or in the North Hemisphere doesn't have the possibility to engage with. I mean, and, 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 and we have seen many propositions. It's not that we are inventing the wheel. What I think is important here, and this is something that BC and Oki and Alana will take in consideration, is how the context inform your biennial, is that the performance has to do with what you are encountering in terms of communal practice, in terms of aesthetic, in terms of the visual, uh, and, but I will say in terms of also the experiential. To me, the best models of biennials in the continent are those that are taking in consideration what it means to occupy the space communally, because this was the way that we used to claim the space as traditional, with the rituals, right? The conventionality of the rituals made institution, right? And that kind of institutions are the ones that then deliver this incredible project. To me, there is not, um, one cannot limit oneself into a model that has a, a, a structure that is rigid and constrained. You have to be loose in that respect. And, and, and there is your political, sort of like your political representation, your political, or let's say the claim of, the potential of your political claim. Thank you, Olivier. Um, 
the question around capitalism and the capitalistic model. Sandrine, Christine, what do you think about the kind of influence on how the design of the biennial comes to play? Because the biennial is seen as a form of regeneration. It's about impacting on the economy, which is about capitalistic models of trade and exchange. There's an art market that sits around and hovers. There are collectors and buyers. They create opportunities for artists as well. Um, what's the right and wrong of it? Is there something um, sinister about the capitalistic kind of tendencies? Or is it just the way the world is? What, what do you think? I think it's, it's a bit tricky in the art world, I mean, we know it, uh, we're almost uh, a little bit like schizophrenic, you know, <laughs> in our relationship to funding and, you know, that allows us to do yeah. what we want to do in art, uh, but, it's, but it's sometimes contradictory to what the art is saying, you know, what the art is claiming. Yes. Um, I mean, in the case of Casablanca, it's, it's been... Um, I mean, it's mainly funded by the person who created right. the biennial... Who's, who's an artist, yeah, and, and who sort of like over 10 years mm. uh, built the residency that we saw, the, yeah. the first image. Um, if a tree. If a tree, mm. yeah. And um, so, yeah, so it's been quite challenging to have like uh, uh, public money from, from Morocco. Uh, and we, we are now, mm. I mean, we decided to work much earlier on the second edition to sort of, uh, you know, try and have like more international partnership that would bring the capital to do the, the project but uh, um, it, it's always a tricky issue because I mean for many years we've had this conversation like, particularly around Dakar where uh, you know a lot of it was funded by Europe uh, or well, by Western money so and with strings attached um, I always say that, you know, there are African people in Europe as well paying their tax, so, you know, we, we also <laughs> contribute to, to something that's going back to our current continent of origin. Uh, but yeah, I think it's, uh, it's always been, it's so, you know, sort of double-edged uh, issue, money and art. And Sandrine, final thoughts on that, and then we'll take one more question, if there is a question. Of course, I agree with the sort of schizophrenic. At the same yeah. time, um, you know, if you use that money to create a critical discourse, I guess, you know, it's the most <laughs> interesting use you can make of it, right? So, uh, schizophrenia can have its productive side, I guess. I mean, a bit of madness. Had, yes, had, it does matter. We've had examples where, you know, the sort of money you take for your project can create, you know, there's been a, I think there was Sydney Biennial where the artist decided not to, and then they boycotted the Biennial mm -hmm. because uh, it was financed by, you know, uh, some company that was, Funding like yes. the detention mm -hmm. detention centers for immigrants, yeah. you know. So I mean, we we still have to be aware of that. It's, uh, well, there's also the kind of state control that we've seen in Havana as well, that yeah. sort of restricted um, certain expressions, um, and uh, led to sort of that form of well censorship, and, and then artists boycotting mm -hmm. the Biennale. But it's driven from a, a, another angle. I, that the state wants to control, not the, not the trade. But some of that state intervention is determined by uh, trading relationships. Yeah. So I know one artist whose work, Ibrahim Ahmed's work, wasn't allowed to venture forth because it was potentially causing a disruption between the government of USA and the government of Cuba. Um, so the power of art continues to be a fantastical kind of yeah. indent on the day-to-day the, the -day of capitalism. And, and, and if and thinking about, thinking about uh, the, let's say, the impact of a specific project in a scene, I want to go back to Dualar and the work that Marilyn Dualabel and, and her late husband, Didier Sharp, did in Douala. Mm -hmm. Because without that, you won't have probably, uh, Godi Lage would have never imagined our bakery, or there will not be, um, I'm trying to remember the name of this other artist, I can't, well, anyway, Bartolomito uh, wouldn't have done, uh, Bartolomito wouldn't have done his project, or the other projects in Jaun that will not have 
happen. I mean, they have nurtured a scene, but not only that, they also, because of the work in Duala as a city, actually the first map of the city was made because of the artistic experience that were taking place in, this, in the city. So there are, there are many things, and, and of course it has to do with training and education, right? So I urge if anybody is interested in a, in a sort of a case study that will, that will sort of span and will help to understand how economics also uh, work in a specific context, that's a good one. So we Amen. have one more question and then we will respond as promptly as we can so you can have a little break before the next session. So the question. Um, I just want to say thank you for all your work. It's in just incredible work that you've been doing. Um, I was very interested in uh, um, the idea of guerrilla cu curating and how that can happen. And I've also seen that that happens here in Venice too. So it's not something that's you know only on the continent. Um, so how do you reconcile that with uh, guerrilla creating, with, re with retaining the work on the continent um, and with open collections, that public collections on the repeat, continent? Repeat that. Repeat the question again around how, the kind of... How do you um, reconcile guerrilla curating with um, retaining the work on the continent and enabling public access and public collections? Um, because it seems that maybe that... People, those people are coming to Venice to buy, and then how would you how do you reconcile those two things? Who wants to answer that? Is, I mean, is, are you, is, yeah. Sorry, are you asking no. how do we reconcile curating? Yeah. Gorilla, yeah. gorilla, because gorilla uh, as Sandrine mentioned, gorilla. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't use that. That I wouldn't use gorilla as a concept. Yeah, really. Ah. Gorilla ah. curating. <laughs> yes. You, but, you, but you respond, and then I respond so to how what I... can say that with? I'm sorry. Retaining a public collection on the continent. So are you saying that the guerrilla creating oh, okay. comes and it goes and... Well, it's something that's being imposed by the fact that you don't really have a public yes, collection, Yes, yes, right? I appreciate that. Yes. So yes. Uh, it, it depends which country. Yeah, yeah, of ah. course. I'm speaking from... For your... From yes, yes. yes, yes. For your individual experience. Yes. <laughs> so I, I think, again... One of the, for me, one of the key things, and I, I think your question is amazing, it's not for that, is that it relates to many issues, no? Um, one has to do with a healthy art scene, right? In which you, you, but again, we're trying to define healthy in Western terms, and this yes. is what I want yes. to avoid, yes. right? It's like having a collection is not necessarily what n needs to happen. Yes. Having ways in keeping the history through artworks and experiences is a different story. Yeah. The way we want to organize that, whether it's a, in terms of a museum, museological terms, which means like, like Pompidou, Tate, MoMA, and others do, that's a different story. Yes. We have to decide what to do. The problem is that, of course, what happens is that they will collect the objects, so they place the urgency to local uh, authorities and collectors and, and uh, students that want to see those words um, directly, no? uh, to, to start collecting, because otherwise the world will go somewhere else. Yeah. So you have to prevent that from happening. But I, I, I'm saying this because one then has to ask oneself whether that's the model we want to follow, right? So capital here is important in that, uh, and that goes to, back to George's questions because if you don't have the tools, so we managed to get out of the cell, the, the imposed representation. Now we are agents of our own narratives, right? We are narrators, we are agents, we are protagonists, okay, fine. But then now we need both the spaces and the, and the capital to both run the spaces and to get the objects. And this is the next step. But in doing that, we also have to decide how we want to do it, right? It is something about to create it. Like, this is a beautiful challenge that my dear friend Kojoko has in Seikmoka, no? This could be the place in which all these concerts are revealed. This could be the place that perhaps a different understanding of collecting can be, can emerge, right? But this is, this is the key thing now. We, we need to figure out whether we want to follow that model, which has goes beyond the biennial model. This is about the foundations of our practice. And, and how something that was happening, I always go back to this, uh, this beautiful essay of Bene Bumbu, where in the 50s and 60s he wrote about 
the vicissitudes of the artists, no? the modern artists, and I also go back to Fanon's on national cultures, right? To try to think about how the interpreters, no? the, 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 what those that were called, as we are called now, to be the interpreters of a certain narrative, plus the artists, plus other members of these ecologies, right? Um, how one can reconcile this personal desire with, with the desire of the community, because that can happen. But how can one reconcile the, the presence of this narrative, of these objects, of this, of, of the capital, of the value that these objects contain, with the need of also wanting to be experiential, uncertain, uh, you know, spontaneous, and, and ready to leave any possible temporality? So. That was a substantial response. So <laughs> I, I think at this moment, on that substantial note, we will all meet for coffee and tea, I hope, in the back. Um, and um, I'd like to thank the panel, starting with Elvira, Christ Christina, <laughs> Christina Aine, whoa, and Sandrine. And Sandrine. <laughs> also, Sarah Gomez, who's somewhere in the sky.